new conglomerates that would dominate the United States financial industry and dominate the United States economy. Mr. President, this is the wrong kind of modernization at the wrong time. Modernization of existing, confusing patchwork of laws and regulations and regulatory authorities would be a good thing. But it's not what this legislation is about. S-900 is really about accelerating the trend towards massive consolidation of the financial sector. This is the wrong kind of modernization because it fails to put in place adequate regulatory safeguards for these new financial giants whose failure would jeopardize or could jeopardize the entire economy. It's the wrong kind of modernization because taxpayers could be stuck with the bill if these conglomerates become too big to fail. This is the wrong kind of modernization because it fails to protect consumers. It allows banks, insurance companies, and brokerage houses to share personal information about consumers' credit history, investments, health treatments, and buying habits. It weakens requirements for banks to invest in their own communities. It will result in higher fees for many customers and price gouging of the unwary, and it will squeeze credit for small businesses and rural America. Most importantly, this is the wrong kind of modernization because it encourages the concentration of more and more economic power in the hands of fewer and fewer people. This concentration will wall off enormous areas of economic decision making from any kind of democratic, and I use democratic with a small d, input or accountability. I don't think there's any doubt that S-900 will set in motion a tidal wave of big money mergers. That's the whole point of the bill, really. The Washington Post quotes industry officials as saying that, quote, the point of reform is to make it as easy as possible for financial services companies to merge with one another and share customer names, addresses, and account data, end of quote. S-900 will prompt other banks to start courting insurance and securities firms, and it will put increasing pressure on banks of every size to find new partners. According to the Post, Analysts say it's likely to set off a spate of mergers over the next few years and will cause consolidation of much of the industry into a handful of financial conglomerates, quote, end of quote. Federal Chairman Alan Greenspan has acknowledged that this kind of consolidation poses dangers for the stability of our financial system. In a speech on October 11, 1999, Mr. Greenspan said, and I quote, we face the reality that the mega banks being formed by growth and consolidation are increasingly complex entities that create the potential for unusually large systemic risks in the national and international economy should they fail, end of quote. Last week, Jeffrey Garten, an investment banker, who served as Under Secretary of Commerce in the Clinton administration, issued a similar warning on the opinion page of the New York Times, and I quote, mega banks like Citigroup or the new Bank of America have become too big to fail. Were they to falter, they could take the entire global financial system down with them, end of quote. The question we have to ask then is whether there's any danger that these financial Goliaths could actually falter. Well, if we listen to Alan Greenspan, maybe there is. In an October 14th speech, the federal chairman, the Fed chairman, warned that financial institutions may be underestimating the risk of a, quote, sharp reversal of confidence, end of quote, in the stock market. Mr. Greenspan was 
talking about not just a, quote, correction or a, quote, bubble in the market, but a much deeper loss of confidence like the one that occurred last year after Russia defaulted on its part of the debt. The result could be, quote, panic reactions that cause financial markets to, quote, seize up. Something doesn't add up here. If Alan Greenspan is right that we need to be on guard against a, quote, sharp reversal of confidence that could cause financial markets to, quote, seize up, and if the Fed chairman is right that financial consolidation creates the potential for unusually large systemic risks, should these conglomerates fail? And if Jeffrey Garten is right that their failure could bring the entire global financial system tumbling down, then it doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense, colleagues, to increase those systemic risks by fostering even more concentration. That is precisely what S-900 does. The problem with S-900 is that its regulatory reach does not match the size of the new conglomerates. S-900 does set up firewalls to protect banks from failures of their insurance and securities affiliates. But even Alan Greenspan has admitted that these firewalls may be weak. Earlier this year, economists Robert Auberbach and James Galbraith warned that, quote, the firewalls may be little more than placing potted plants between the deaths of huge holding companies, end of quote. And as the chairman of the FDIC has testified, quote, in times of stress, firewalls tend to weaken, end of quote. Regulators will have little desire to stop violations of these firewalls if they think a holding company is, quote, too big to fail. In his New York Times article, former Secretary of Commerce Jeffrey Garten concluded, and I quote, the seesaw of private and public power is seriously unbalanced. We seem determined, Mr. President, to unlearn the lessons from our past mistakes. We seem determined to unlearn the lessons from our past mistakes. Scores of banks failed in the Great Depression as a result of unsound banking practices, and their failure only deepened the crisis. Glass-Steagall was intended to protect our financial system by insulating commercial banking from other forms of risk. It was one of several stabilizers designed to keep a similar tragedy from recurring. Now Congress is about to repeal that stabilizer without putting any comparable safeguard in its place. In a stinging attack on S-900, conservative columnist William Sapphire wrote earlier this week, and I quote, global financiers are given the green light for ever greater concentration of power. Few remember the reason for those firewalls, to curtail the spread of the sort of panic from one financial segment to another that helped lead to the Great Depression. But today's lust for global gigantism has swept aside the voices of prudence. And what about the issues of the savings and loan crisis? The Garn St. Germain Act of 1982 allowed thrifts, do you remember this, to expand their services beyond basic home loans. Only seven years later, taxpayers were tapped for a multi-billion dollar bailout. I'm afraid we're running the same kind of risks with S-900. These financial conglomerates may be well tempted to run greater risks knowing that the taxpayers will come to their rescue if things go bad. In a letter to me earlier this week, Professor Bob Arberback of the LBJ School wrote, quote, taxpayers should be notified that S-900 substantially increases their risk on the 2.8 trillion in federally insured deposits for which they are liable. And what about the lessons of the Asian crisis?
Just recently, the financial press was crowing about the inadequacy of the Asian banking systems. Now we're considering a bill that would make our banking system more like theirs. The much maligned, cozy relationships between Asian banks, brokers, insurance companies, and commercial firms are precisely the kind of, quote, crony capitalism that I fear S-900 would promote. If we want to locate the causes of the Asian crisis, I think we have to look at the reckless liberalization of capital markets that led to unbalanced development and made these economies so vulnerable to investor panic in the first place. The IMF and other multilateral financial institutions failed to understand how dangerous and destabilizing financial regulation, deregulation, can be without first putting into a place appropriate safeguards. World Bank chief economist Joseph Stiglitz wrote last year about the Asian crisis, and I quote, the rapid growth and large influx of foreign investment created economic strain. In addition, heavy foreign investment combined with weak financial regulation to allow lenders in many Southeast Asian countries to rapidly expand credit, often risky borrows, making the financial system more vulnerable. Inadequate oversight, not overregulation, caused these problems. Consequently, our effort should not be on deregulation, but on finding the right regulatory regime to reestablish stability and confidence. That's Joseph Stiglitz. World Bank chief economist. We claim to have learned our lessons from the crisis in Asia, but I'm not sure we have. So why on earth are we doing this? And why now? Why on earth are we doing this? And why now? For whose benefit is this legislation being passed? Financial services firms argue that consolidation is necessary for their survival. They claim they need to be as large and diversified as foreign firms in order to compete in the global marketplace. But the United States financial industry is already dominant across the globe and in recent years has been quite profitable. I see no crisis of competitiveness. Financial firms also argue that consolidation will produce efficiencies that could be passed on to consumers. But there's little evidence that big mergers translate into more efficiency or better service. In fact, studies by the Federal Reserve indicate just the opposite. There is no convincing evidence that mergers produce greater economic efficiencies. On the contrary, they often lead, and this is my prediction is exactly what's going to happen, to higher banking fees and charges for small businesses, farmers, and other customers. A recent Fed study showed bigger banks tend to charge higher fees for ATM machines and other services. Bigger banks offer fewer loans for small businesses. And other Fed studies have shown that the concentration of banking squeezes out community banking. In the long debate, over passage of this legislation. There's been a lot of talk about the conflicting interests of bankers, insurance companies, and brokers. There's been a lot of talk about the jurisdictional battles between the Federal Reserve and the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the OCC. But there has been precious little discussion in this debate of the public interest. What about the interests of ordinary consumers? An earlier version of this legislation contained a provision to ensure that people with lower incomes have access to basic banking services. The problem is that banking services are increasingly beyond the reach of millions of Americans. According to the United States PERG, the average cost of a checking account is $217 per year, a major obstacle for opening up a bank account for lower income families. These families have to rely instead on usurious check cashing operations and money order services. Nevertheless, this basic banking provision 
was stripped out of the bill. I don't see very much protection for consumers in S-900 either. Banks that have always offered safe, federally insured deposits will have every incentive to lure their customers into riskier investments. Last year, for example, Nations Bank paid $7 million to settle charges that it misled bank customers into investing in risky bonds through a securities affiliate, affiliate that it set up with Morgan Stanley Dean Witter. S-900 makes nominal attempts to address these problems, but in the end, I'm afraid this legislation is an invitation to fraud and abuse. One of the most objectionable aspects of S-900 is the absence of protections for consumer privacy. The conference report will allow the various affiliates of a financial conglomerate to share sensitive confidential information about their customers. William Sapphire writes, and I quote, as for financial privacy, S-900 makes your bank account everyone's business. Without your consent, the private information you write on your mortgage application with your tax return attached goes to your insurance company, which already has your health industry, and its snoops can also see your investment behavior and what you've been buying with your credit cards. Under S-900, giant financial conglomerates using other surveillance to protect against fraud will know more about your money, your habits, your assets, your disease, and your genetic makeup than your spouse does and probably more than you do. I tell you something, it is a little disconcerting to be a senator and have to read columns like this to know some of the real potential for abuse and serious invasion of the privacy of citizens. We need to have a much, much more discussion about these kind of implications for citizens' privacy in Minnesota and all across the country. And I'm going to repeat the last part of this quote. Under giant financial conglomerates, Mr. Sapphire argues, using other surveillance to protect against fraud, under S-900, giant financial conglomerates, using other surveillance to protect against fraud will know more about your money, your habits, your assets, your diseases, and your genetic makeup than your spouse does, and probably more than you do. Law professor Joe Reidenbach, Reidenberg, excuse me, of Fordham University, concludes, this is an astounding loss of privacy for the American citizens, and I want to shout this from the floor of the United States Senate. This is an astounding loss of privacy for American citizens. The impact of S-900 on the Community Reinvestment Act, CRA, is another cause for real concern. When the Senate considered S-900 earlier this year, I argued that if we were serious about modernizing the financial sector of our country, we should be serious about modernizing CRA along with it. There have been few financial tools available to families and communities that have been as effective and has had as great an impact, positive impact, as CRA. An estimated $1 trillion has been reinvested in our towns and cities thanks to this legislation, CRA legislation. The conference report on S-900 actually undermines the effectiveness of CRA in several ways. H.R. 10 contained a so-called have and maintain clause, which required banks to have a satisfactory CRA rating before merging with securities or insurance firms, but also required them to maintain their rating afterwards. In S-900, the have and maintain clause has been whittled down to a have clause. Banks will not be required to continue doing business in their communities. Not only does this pale version 
of the have and maintain clause fail to modernize CRA, it actually weakens it. I wonder where the administration was in these negotiations. Furthermore, under S-900, communities, consumers, and public interest organizations will see their opportunities for public comment limited. They will not have a chance to comment on mergers when banks who've received a satisfactory CRA rating are applying to become a financial holding company. Again, to me, this looks more like a rollback than it does modernization. Finally, under the S-900 conference report, smaller banks that receive a satisfactory CRA rating will be reviewed every four years instead of every two. Smaller banks that receive an excellent CRA rating will be reviewed every five years. Since an estimated 97% of all small banks currently receive a satisfactory or better CRA rating, S-900 will essentially remove the majority of banks from regular CRA review process. There are a number of reasons why banks must be reviewed by regulators, but it's only with regard to CRA that we're cutting back the requirements for review. In reality, S-900 reflects the same priority of interests as financial consolidation itself. It offers a little something for everyone in the financial services industry. It's a Santa's wish list for the big banks. It gives enough to security firms and the insurance industry to keep them on board, but it basically has nothing to offer for low-income families, nothing for rural and minority communities, and very little for consumers. This should not be surprising. I don't think it's a mere coincidence, and I, there is no one-to-one -one correlation. I have congratulated some of my colleagues on their political skill, but I do not at a systemic level think that there's any, that, that it's just a mere coincidence that finance insurance and real estate spent more than any other industries on congressional campaigns and lobbying Capitol Hill. This is a reformer's dream issue. It is not surprising and it's not a coincidence that the finance, the insurance, and real estate interests spend more than any other industries on congressional campaigns and lobbying on Capitol Hill. Last year, they shelled out more than $200 million on lobbying activities, according to the Center for Responsive Politics. And they've made more than $150 million in campaign contributions since 1996. As William Sapphire wrote on November 1st, quote, generous financial lobbyists, or lobbies, have persuaded our leaders that in enormous size, there is strength. Generous lobbies have been making the same case in other industries as well with equal success. Similar consolidation is occurring in agriculture, the media, entertainment, health care, airlines, telecommunications, you name it. Teddy Roosevelt, where are you when we need you? Who's going to take on these monopolies? Who's going to call for antitrust action? When are we going to be on the side of people and consumers? In fact, we are witnessing the biggest wave of mergers and economic concentration since the late 1800s. There were 4,728 reportable mergers in 1998 compared to 3,087 in 1993. 1,521 in 1991, and a mere 804 in 1980. And as Joel Klein, head of the Justice Department's Antitrust Division, has pointed out, the value of last year's mergers equaled the combined value of all mergers from 1999 through 1996 put together. What's in store for us if we allow this trend to continue? Pretty soon we're going to have three financial service firms in this country, four airlines, two media conglomerates, and five energy giants. Huge financial conglomerates the size of Citigroup will truly be too big to fail. 
government officials and members of the Congress will be prone to confuse Citigroup's interests with the public interests if they don't already. What happens when one of these colossal conglomerates decides, for example, that it might like to turn a profit by privatizing Social Security? Who's going to stand in their way? That's a trick question, of course, because we already face that dilemma today. But I contend that the economic concentration resulting from the passage of S-900 would only make that problem worse. The bigger these financial conglomerates get, the more influence they have over public policy choices. The bigger they get, the more money they will have to spend on political campaigns. The bigger they get, the more lobbyists they will be able to amass on Capitol Hill. And the bigger they get, the more weight they will carry in the media. I'm going to repeat that. The bigger these financial conglomerates get, the more influence they're going to have over public policy choices. The bigger they get, the more money they'll have to spend on political campaigns. The bigger they get, the more lobbyists they will have to amass on Capitol Hill. And the bigger they get, the more weight they will carry with the media. It's a vicious cycle. These financial conglomerates used their political clout to shape public policy that helped them grow so big in the first place, now their overwhelming size makes it easier for them to dictate policies that will help them get even bigger. It's a vicious cycle. I want to repeat this because I think this is exactly what's going on here in the Congress. These financial conglomerates use their political clout to shape public policies that helped them grow so big in the first place. Now their overwhelming size makes it easier for them to dictate policies that are going to help them get even bigger. Jeffrey Garton's remarkable October 26 column called attention to this problem. This was again in New York Times. Quote, many mega companies may be beyond the law, Garton said. Quote, their deep pockets can buy teams of lawyers that can stymie prosecution for years. And if they lose in court, they can afford to pay the huge fines without damaging their operations. Moreover, no one should be surprised that mega companies navigate our scandalously porous campaign finance system to influence tax policy, environmental standards, social security financing, and other issues of national policy. Yes, companies have always lobbied, but these huge corporations often have more pull. Because there are fewer of them, their influence can be more focused, and in some cases, the country may be highly dependent on their survival. For example, corporate giants can have enormous leverage when they focus on America's foreign and trade policy. Defense contractors like Lockheed Martin, itself a result of a merger of two big firms, were able to exert extraordinary powerful force to influence legislation that approved the enlarging of NATO, a move that opened up new markets for American weapon sales to Poland and the Czech Republic. Companies like Boeing, which not long ago acquired McDonnell Douglas, have expanded their already formidable influence on trade policy toward countries like China. Boeing is now the only American commercial aircraft manufacturer. Corporations like Exxon Mobil, Mr. Garton goes on to argue, will negotiate with oil producing countries almost as equals, conducting the most powerful private diplomacy since the 19th century, when the British East India Company wielded near sovereign influence in Asia. As long as the economy remains strong, the rise of corporate power with inadequate public oversight will not be high on the national agenda. But sooner or later, perhaps starting with the next serious economic downturn, the United States 
we'll have to confront one of the great challenges of our time. How does a sovereign nation govern itself effectively when politics are national and business is global? When the answers start coming, they could be as radical and as prolonged as the backlash against unbridled corporate power that took place during the first 40 years of this century. Indeed, Mr. President, we've been through this before. At the end of the 19th century, industrial concentration accelerated at an alarming rate. Various observers, including the columnist and author E.J. Dion, the philosopher Michael Sandel, actually, I would even include former House Speaker Newt Gingrich, have noted the similarities between that era, the end of the 19th century, and our own. In the gilded age of the late 1800s and the progressive era of the early 1900s, the danger of concentrated economic power was widely recognized and hotly debated. And this speech on the floor of the United States Senate, I give with a sense of history because I believe this will become a front burner issue in American politics. Many Americans deeply believed then, and they do now, that a free and democratic society could not prosper with such concentration of power and inequalities of wealth. As the great Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis said, quote, we can have a democracy in this country, or we can have wealth in the hands of a few. We can't have both. The idea that concentrations of wealth, of economic power, which is exactly what S-900 is all about, and of political power are unhealthy for our democracy is a theme that runs throughout American history. From Thomas Jefferson to Andrew Jackson to the Progressive Era to the New Deal, Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson warned not only against the concentration of political power, but also the concentration of economic power. We should not, senators, let that debate die out. That's why I come to the floor of the United States Senate. It's a vital part of our democratic with a small d heritage. It's a heritage that teaches us that ordinary people should have more say about the economic decisions that affect their lives. Repealing or weakening CRA isn't going to give them that. No amount of anti-government rhetoric is going to give them that. But enforcing some meaningful consumer protections would. So would protecting the privacy of sensitive personal information. And so would stopping, putting a stop to mergers that crowd out community banking, squeeze credit for small businesses, and open the door to higher fees and more gouging of consumers. A lot of banks don't like CRA. A lot of financial service firms don't want to be bothered with regulations to protect individual privacy. They denounce it as, quote, big government and, quote, overregulation. But for most people, which is the greater danger in these situations? Concentration of political power in the government or concentration of economic power? I don't think it's a close call. I will tell you that when I go to the Town Talk Cafe in Wilmer, or any cafe in Minnesota, and I just start talking to people, and mainly listening to people over a cup of coffee or two, I find that people have what I would describe, Mr. President, Senator from Kansas, a healthy distrust of big government, a healthy distrust of overly centralized and overly bureaucratized public policy. I love it when people say, get us some capital. 
Let us make things happen at the neighborhood and community level. I love the language of homegrown economies. I'd rather have small businesses make, I'd rather have small business people who live in the community be the ones who make the capital investment decisions that determine whether our communities are going to do well or not than some multinational financial services conglomerate folks halfway across the world or halfway across the country making the capital investment decisions that determine whether our communities live or die. I'd like the decision making to be in the communities. I appreciate that focus on local development, on more self-reliant, self-sufficient people and more self-reliant, self-sufficient